this morning we are looking at the incarnation of Jesus Christ and we're looking at the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 26 to 38 and we're reading from the Message Bible and then a little later I'll be reading it again from the King James. It sounds a little more um, traditional if we read it from the King James and kind of fits into our understanding of the Christmas story. And so in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to to the Galilean village of Nazareth, to the virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph, and the virgin's name, Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty, beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. I never heard it put that way. (laughs) God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great, be called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever, no end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never slept with a man. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy, Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived the son old as she is? Everyone called her barren. And here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, yes, I see it all now. I am the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. Then the angel left her. As we think of the birth of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, this is the focal point of the Christmas story, I believe, it is, the, it, is the, it is the conception of Jesus Christ. If Jesus is not divine in his origin, then everything that he represents falls short. Because it is this incarnation, which means uh, as the assuming by God of human nature, God becomes man. The assuming of God by human nature in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is the fixed and permanent physical dwelling of God in this world as opposed to a temporary manifestation of a divine purpose. So we have God becoming man. And if God does not become man, then the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is not divine. See, if, if, if God is going to die for the sins of humanity, God has to become man. And there are a number of, um, even, in the, even in ancient times, there were challenges to this doctrine or to this thought. Some people felt that the divine Jesus came upon him, the God came upon Jesus at the baptism, and that he left Jesus before the cross because God can't die. I mean, there was those types of theologies and types of heresies that were going on. But we have in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. So if Jesus is not divine, then God didn't die for our sin. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the wages of sin doesn't change. There just has to be a sacrifice. So because God was going to be the sacrifice for sin, he didn't have to change the wage. He paid the price. I remember the story of a a judge, and this is just a story, um, where the judge his best friend came before him, before the uh, judge's bench, and the friend that he had had committed a crime and that he was, had a sentence of a financial sentence and also an incarceration. And the judge and and the friend and everybody thought, well, the judge is going to let him off easy. You know, it's his friend and so on. And uh, when when the case was over, the judge sentenced him to the highest penalty of the law, the maximum amount of money and the maximum amount of time. And this was a great shock to 
to everyone who heard the judge make this declaration. And then the judge says, I will pay that price for you. I will serve your sentence and I will pay the price. So he didn't change, you know, the guy was guilty and he didn't change what the judgment was because he was his friend. He, he gave him, as it were, the, the full sentence of what the crime merited. And so in our life, in the, in the life of humanity, the wages of sin is death. There is no other wage, there is no other penalty for sin. Sin is separation from God. God said, I will pay the price for your sin. And the full price of sin is death. I will die in your place. I will die for you. So that's why when we read this of the incarnation, we read about God becoming man and why it's so very important to our faith. Why it's so very important to who we are as an individual. That everything that is in the scriptures and everything that is written about Jesus Christ and about what Christ has done is based upon God becoming man. And because of that, we find that Christ is with us and he is our hope and he is our strength and he is our redeemer. And and he is these things because he is God become man. He gave up all of his divine privileges. He gave up all of those things and set them aside so that he would become fully human, fully human, fully God, and that he would die for our sins. So this is the most critical point, I believe, in the life of Christ, and in, 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 it's the understanding of the incarnation, the understanding of the conception of Jesus Christ. And everything builds from this foundation. If Christ is not divine, then God did not die. If Christ is not human, then he cannot understand what it is like to be like me. So that is why, as divinity, God paying the price. As humanity, he is like me and understands what it is like to be human. In all points tempted as, I, on all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So here we have that package, that incarnation of God becoming man and being with us. I remember a pastor a number of years ago, we were talking in our local clergy, and the pastor's long gone from our area. Um, I remember him saying in the clergy meeting, we were sitting around talking, he says, well, it really doesn't matter that if Jesus was divine or not. It's just the idea that he came. And no, that's not true. It matters completely whether Jesus is divine. Because if he is not divine, then God doesn't die for our sin. If he is not human, then he doesn't understand what it is like to be me, to be like us. So here he is giving up his divinity to become like us so that we can become like him. We cannot live the Christian life without Christ. We need Christ. We need his strength. We need his power to live the Christian life. If being a Christian were me making an effort to live a better life, you know, let me make a, a New Year's resolution. Those are coming up, so you're going to write them down, so you'll be, be sure and keep them this year. I know last year you couldn't, but this year you will. Right? Yeah, right, okay. Because, you know, all you need is to make up your mind and it'll be all right. <laughs> so as we look at this, we find how the Christ is at work in our life to help us live this Christian life. As we look through the scriptures, and I, I gave you a number of scriptures, I'm probably going to skip through them. Um, the first one is John 1, 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. We have listed in the New Testament, we have a number of things written about Christ. He is the light of the world. And the next one is uh, 1 Timothy three sixteen. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true God in this springs is great. He appeared in a body was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. We see how Paul is affirming the divinity and yet the humanity of Christ. This isn't a new doctrine. This is the doctrine that originated at the birth of Christ. This is the doctrine that originated in the early church. It is the foundational principle of our faith. God becomes man to live to die, 
to rise again. And Paul affirms his humanity. And Paul says, the incarnation is the basis of our being right with God. It is God who takes away the sin of the world. It is Christ who forgives me of my sin. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is God's love for us that brings about our forgiveness, that brings about our relationship with Christ. Um, was vindicated by the Spirit. His resurrection shows us the power of the Holy Spirit that abided in him, that was abiding in him. It's the same, if the same Spirit that is in Christ lives in you, he shall quicken your mortal bodies. It is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Spirit that resides within us. It's that resurrection spirit. So proclaimed throughout the scriptures is this declaration that God became flesh and dwelt among us. In the early church, false prophets were picked out by their, by their declaration or their acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Some of them believed, didn't believe that he was the Son of God. I want to skip down to uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the time of great darkness in the history of Israel, Isaiah is this prophet who saw God. And I, I, I love Isaiah 5, uh, or Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and his glory filled the temple. And, and Isaiah has this wonderful vision of God and how the God is calling him to proclaim the message. But later on in, in Isaiah 9, the, the prophet talks about hope that is coming to Israel. And the hope that is coming to Israel is that there is going to be given to us a child. The time of great darkness, God promises that God will send a great light what we had already read in the New Testament, that Christ is the great light. Isaiah prophesied this great light and the message of hope that was to be found in Jesus Christ. And he wasn't going to be an ordinary child. He is going to be a child that is given, that is um, the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And then he goes on in Isaiah, and then go back to Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give us a sign. God is going to give us a sign. He's going to give to the nation of Israel a sign. And what is the sign? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. The virgin will conceive. And what do we read of in the scriptures? As we read the text again in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and beginning at verse, 20, at verse 26, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month is meaning of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And what does he say in verse 27? To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. So hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah the prophet speaks about a virgin conceiving God becoming man. We shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So it is in this setting of scriptural and in this setting of prophecy, in this setting of how that God has promised, even from Abraham onward down through to the birth of Christ, how that a Messiah would come and how that he would come. He would come through a virgin. And that holy See, that holy thing in your womb will be from God. See, this isn't just a story you know, that's made up around the campfires. This is a prophetic utterance of thousands of years of prophecy, of thousands of years of history, of the tabernacle of the Old Testament and the sacrifices where the Lamb of God was sacrificed in the Old Testament, a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people, we have Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, God becoming man, so that we might become like him. 
So the virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, the betrothal in the, old, in the time of Christ. The betrothal was that, it's like for us, it would be like an engagement, but it was a marriage before marriage. <laughs> that it was a year before the marriage ceremony, a woman and a man would be betrothed, meaning that they were married, but yet they, could, they didn't live together. So there was no sexual relationships, but they were betrothed. There was a marriage before the marriage. So a year from now, you will be husband and wife, but the marriage betrothal starts now. And so Mary was in this year of betrothal to Joseph. And where is and who are they from? They are the house of David because of the prophecy that was given to David. Verse 28. And the angel came to her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. Here is a woman who is God-honored. Here is a woman among all humankind who is different, who is privileged. She is, she is human. She is a human person, like you and I, human being. And that which is conceived in her is divine. So he is divine, he is human. And thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Above all women, Mary is espoused or held in high esteem. She is a very, very godly woman. And when she saw him, she was troubled. We saw that in the uh, Message Bible. It spoke about how that she was thoroughly shaken. <laughs> she was like, whoa, what's this all about? The angel showing up. And this was not a common thing that happened with Mary, that you know, angels showed up in her in her in her house and talked to her. No, this was, this was something completely out of the ordinary. Thou art highly favored. Uh, when she was, saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. She was wondering what, what was behind the greeting like this. I mean, here is this angel showing up to her and saying, you're highly favored. And she couldn't figure out what this was all about. And the angel said to her, fear not. Fear not. Why does God tell us, don't be afraid? (laughs) Because we're scared to death. (laughs) So Mary's frightened. Thou have found, you have found favor. It's interesting how that God, God's love to our life shows up in different ways. And sometimes it comes to us whenever we are in doubt or in fear, wondering what's next. Well, here we have the angel coming and making this declaration. But the declaration that the angel is stating fits everything that has been prophesied in the Old Testament about her or about this Messiah. Verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. (laughs) Shall call his name Jesus. Mary, you have nothing to fear. God is a surprise for you. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> That's in the Message Bible. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. And what is he going to be like? He will be great. And he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. So this is no ordinary child. This is someone who is going to be the fulfillment of everything and everything that the nation of Israel has hoped for is all coming at this very point in time into your life. The incarnation, God becoming man, is so very focal to everything that is going to transpire in the life of Christ. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be what? What is it? No end. He is eternal. Here he is, see... It is impossible for God to die. Why? He's an eternal being. The only way God can die is for him to become human. He has to become like us because we are the ones who will die. We are, the only, we are capable of dying only because of our sin. You know, if you go back to the garden, we were not created to die. We were created to live forever. We were created to live forever with God and walk with God and be his children and, you know, and walk on the earth and be with God. But we, mankind, sinned. And with sin came spiritual death and came physical death. 
In Jesus Christ came spiritual life and physical life. That's why it's so important that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why it's so important that Jesus, be con- his conception, be divine. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? <laughs> Mary understands how these things happen. You know, children are not just born, you know. I, I haven't, in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can I've never slept with a man? <clears throat> That's affirmed she is a virgin one who has never had sexual relations. And how can this be? How can I have a child? And the angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. I I liken this hover over you. If you go back to creation, and where it speaks about how that the Spirit hovered over or brooded over the earth and brought it into existence, that that it is this creativity of God in the womb of Mary, the creativity of God over the earth, the creativity of God in our own lives, that God is in us, and that the creativeness of God, that, that I believe that we should be the most creative people on the planet, the cre- that Christians should be the most creative people in the world because the Holy Spirit that, that abides within us is the same Spirit that was there in creation and, and creates and ignites that spark of creativity in our own lives. He shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which is, shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God, the Incarnation, the Son of God. The child you bring forth will be called holy. He shall be called the Son of God. And then, verse 36. This is this this is like one of those throw in. Here's Mary having this experience. And you ever have one of those experiences which you, you, you doubt that it really was a good experience after it's over? You know, huh, I, I, well, that was really, that was really something. I, I wonder if that was really true. Well, here is, you know, she has this experience with the angel Gabriel coming to her. And then she has this nugget of truth that is going to hold her, to let her know that everything she has, ex- has experienced from Gabriel is true. Because her cousin, Elizabeth, in her old age has six months with child, and she was barren. They didn't have Twitter. (laughs) Didn't have Facebook. (laughs) There was no public newsletter. Hey, did you hear? There was a great distance, not not in our time, not a great distance, but in their time, a great distance between them. And she now knows that her cousin is having a child And how could she know this? And so she travels there a little later in the story. She travels there to Elizabeth and gives this salutation. And, you know, Mary, of course, Elizabeth is having a child. And it is exactly as the angel said about with Elizabeth. Then it comes back to Mary and it affirms to her, it is exactly as the angel has said unto me, this is what's going to happen. And Mary said, and this is bringing it even to our life, Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Mary, in the the Message Bible, says, I see it all now. It kind of all fit into place. Be it unto me according to thy word. The word of God is the creative force of God. And when we read the scriptures, and the word gives us hope that I will never leave you nor forsake you that God has a plan and a purpose for our life, that God has a way of turning things around to the good. No matter what happens, God is at work working things to the good. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God has a way of turning things around. The word of God is creative power of God speaking in our life, and the spirit of God hovers over us and creates, brings to life the Word of God in us. 
And it brings to life that divine person, that divine presence of God inside of us that tells us that God is in charge, God will work everything together for good. Did you know it was a year to the day that I had my surgery last year that I was in the hospital again? The very day. It was like, wow, one year to the day I was back in the hospital. And I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you know, God, I'm sure you got a plan, but I don't like it. But, uh, <laughs> but God has a way. And, you know, again, what's the, 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 all of the stuff behind it? I don't know. But God has a way of working everything together for good. And God has a way of working in our life in this Christmas season. Remember, God is with us. Because of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God becoming man and being born of a virgin And the basis of our faith isn't in the presence that we get under the tree. The basis of our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God becoming like us so that we could become like him. That he would become the sacrifice for our sin that nothing would ever separate us from the presence of God. That's the purpose, or some of the purpose of the incarnation, that God become man so that we could become like him, so that we could become like him. Amen? Shall we stand? (sighs) Jesus, we thank you that you have saved us from our sin. You become the sacrifice. You become the focus of our confession. Our sin is not the problem, Lord. You have removed that from our lives and our confession. God, we are not worthy to receive. But yet, Lord, you love us just simply because of who we are. You accept us because of who we are. And Lord, you work in our life because of who we are. Gracious. You love us. May this Christmas season, O Lord, that we are entering, may it be one in which we never forget. The incarnation. God becomes man so that we might become your child. Bless us, O God. Bless this season as we focus on Christ and not on the Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.